Thanks for tuning in to the Pace Performance Podcast. So today is slightly different that we've got two people on, and also slightly different. It's a slightly different topic, not necessarily technical, but super, super interesting and really excited to get George Perry. And for his fifth time, I was corrected, Martin Vrishite. So welcome to the podcast, guys. Hey, Rob. Thanks, Rob. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming on. So we're not going to go into in-depth intros. Martin, you've done it four times before. Um, and George, yours will come up in the conversation as, as we go. But I'm going to come to you first, Martin, on this topic of ego. Why, why was it so important for you to delve deep into that and then obviously follow through into the result of, of which, which was the book? Yeah, it could, could, could be a long story, but it's definitely something um, that comes from, from, from far and l- long time ago. I've been probably struggling with, with mine as well, being always willing to be the, the, the first at many levels and really to make, um, make a, I don't know, a difference maybe on the sports science world and at, at many levels. And then probably when you start to reach a certain level of of achievement, the development of yourself, the, the things you, you put in place, you probably start to, to struggle even more when people tend to, to judge, to judge yourself or question what, what you're doing. And this is when are, are starting to really get, uh, into, let's say, overall the topic to understand myself and really to be able to, to, to deal with the, my overall work environment. And this is obviously something that has been building up over the last 10, 15 years. So it's not something new, but the more, the more you progress into achieving things, probably the, the greater the, the, the challenge, you know. So it came from really something that I had to understand about myself. Um, and it's when I started to, to question others, how they were dealing with themselves, how they were dealing in their daily work environment. And this is how we, we, we came to the decision of, taking those phone calls to colleagues and friends to a whole book in the end. And George, where do you fit into this? I like the story, tell it. So one day I was doing what I do most mornings and that's going through the freelance market, uh, the freelance work market website, the marketplace uh, Upwork and looking for anything in the real world of content marketing, particularly in sports, because that's what I do. Um, I'm a freelance marketer as well as a, a coach. And I saw that there's a job posting for looking for an editor, maybe a partner in some capacity. And I clicked on it and it was from Marin Bukite. And I said, whoa, if Marin Bukite is looking for an editor, a, co- a co-conspirator, if he's looking for anything, I'm going to be a part of it. <laughs> because in our little world of sports science, I mean, Martin is a household name. And I said, this chance does not come around often. COVID is shutting down the world. And hot damn, I'm getting on this. So I responded and over the next uh, couple messages and the first few phone calls, I, I used my copious ego to full effect and worked my way onto the project. Martin, how much are you cringing after that? <laughs> <laughs> no, no comment. <laughs> no comment. Nice. So would f- you say freelance writer, George? Yeah. So I've, I've been in the sports okay. industry for about 10 years now. I like to say I've done every job in it except for being an athlete. So I've coached and managed a semi-pro track and field team. I've worked uh, freelance and as a consultant for a lot of sports tech companies, um, startups, both on the business and the performance side of our industry, as well as a lot of writing, uh, both for you know fan sites, opinion and analysis sites, um, data analysts, um, pretty much a little bit of everything. And most of what I've done in the past has been blogs and articles. And this was by far the most ambitious project I've ever undertaken. But once I started talking to Martin and, you know, going beyond just knowing his reputation, but getting to know him and this project and what it meant to him and reading the early drafts, I saw a really unique opportunity to be a part of something special to and to talk about something and work on something that's you know really close to me which is high performance sports and ego and it was i mean and, and just what Marin had already in his pocket when i came on board was was incredible and it really you know it it was obviously a once in a lifetime chance martin at the, at the start of the book i think it's worded something like this is the book that you wish you'd had at the start of your career what what kind of things at the start of your career would 
this book have been telling a young Martin Bushite that he needed to know? Yeah, well, you're spot on, and that, that's definitely the, the why of the book, and this is why this overall project has been and is still so important to me, because I always found that there was a missing piece in uh, both probably my education, of course uni, you know, we always then, everyone on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the podcast talks about the soft skills and everything, that, that's, that's obvious, you know, but it's even more than soft skills, because again, it's more about yourself than dealing with others. And now there's a lot of training again as well around, yeah, build relationship, blah, 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 all this aspect, which is super important. But how to deal with yourself? This is, <laughs> this is nowhere. And that, as I said, as an introduction, that, that was my, my, my own challenge. So if I had that awareness earlier, then how to manage better my, my ego overall, which is a mix between my ambition, but my ability to listen and to really find the right balance. I would have been a better professional from the start. So I had to wait to get things in my face, to get disappointed at some stage, to go through, as I said, achievements, to kind of learn, but the hard way. And, and I guess, and we have a section on the book as well, and we had a few contributors saying the same, that you often have to hard to, to learn it the hard way to really get to understand it. But still, you know, if I had been warmed, if I had been trained a little bit, um, I would have done better. I would have been better for sure. Uh, so it's really about the awareness about yourself. And of course, there is this, this, this part with, with how to deal with, with the others and, and so on. Um, but yeah, this is something that we are not trained uh, for at all. Was there any examples, Martin, early, early on where a greater self-awareness would have helped you in certain situations but so so many times so many times and i can start i don't know 2005 something i'm conditioning coach of a women handball team um i'm doing my analy my analysis i'm seeing things on the pitch i'm testing the athletes so everything is crystal clear for me we should be doing this we should not be doing that because it's based on measurements it's science based it's i've put all, all my my weekend work into it so I know everything and it has to be like that. Over the weekend, the coach decides to do something else. Pfft, what is this? You know, <laughs> what, what is this? What an idiot. What is she doing? We clash. I, I slam the door. I leave the, I leave the club, you know. So you cannot behave like, like that if you, you, you cannot. This is excessive. So in this case, my, my ego has been too much, you know, maybe it had helped me. To, to run all, all those those analyses and to do what I've done, which was pretty, I guess, pretty cool. But it was too much because the volume was on, was full on, and I was not able to put myself in her shoes, like she, she was she was the, the coach, in her shoes to understand, meet her halfway, understand, discuss, blah, blah, blah. And I kind of even killed myself. And this happened to me many, many times. So once you you you, you repeat those errors again and again, over 10, 15 years, you start to think, okay, I might need to to change something for myself with myself as well. Mm -hmm. George, just just coming over to you. Why do you do what you do? And it's it's a it's an interesting little. There's a couple of interesting places in the book where you almost acknowledge your own ego and your the things that you do. Many of the things are, are because of your own ego. So I'm just interested to hear why you do what you do. I do what I do because it's. I mean, for lack of a better, because it's what I want to do, because it's where I've, I've found fulfillment, um, you know, professionally and personally. Um, you know, I, before getting into the sports world, I was an officer in the U.S. Navy. I was on a submarine for five years. I then went to law school, which lasted one year, and then uh, found my way into the world of sports science, coaching, and then from there into sports management. And it's kind of funny the way you asked that question, Rob, because a couple of weeks ago, I was working with uh, two young athletes who I coach. You know, they're just, you know, 12 and 13 year old sisters. And one of them said, of all the jobs you've had, which one do you like the most? I thought that was, you know, a cute little question from a kid. But when I thought about it, I said, well, clearly this one, because at this age, after everything I've done, this is the one I've landed on. This is the one that makes me, you know, the happiest to do is the one where I meet a new challenge every day, where I feel like I'm putting my abilities to really good use. And I get something out of it, you know, spiritually, egoistically, as well as, you know, to some limited extent financially. 
but it's it's just what I have found checks every box for me. And I kind of think that's what we all need to do in some ways. And whether that takes you into law, medicine, media, uh, engineering, or sports, you have to find that aspect of your life or, or that, you know, that fulfillment of your work values that will check all those boxes. Because otherwise, you're going to end up in situations where you are unhappy and then your ego is unsatisfied. And then it can go into any number of the uh, ego F-ups that we encounter in chapter three of our book. Or those really deep conflicting situations that, you know, ultimately come to a head uh, in chapter 10. And there's two good plugs for the book right there. <laughs> of course, keep them coming. But why does why does ego have such a negative connotation when you read some people when people get the book and read some of the quotes from people in high performance environments, that it is this very fine balance between yes, Ego can be a negative thing, but harnessed in the right way can be a po really positive thing. I think Keir, Keir when and Flat puts, I don't know where he'd robbed that from, a little quote about it burning your house down or, or I can't remember the exact quote, but a really good one. So why, George, why does it come with this negative connotation when there's so many positives if harnessed I, in the right I think way? We, I think we have a, a cultural bias against it. Um, you know, I, I think we have a cultural bias against the self and against individualism in many ways. And ego originally meant simply the word I. And when you, you know, take away a lot of the um, connotations that have come around it, it's about how the self interacts with reality. You know, we, early in the book, we look at some of the dictionary definitions of it. And it's really a simple word that's taken on a life of its own and that has all these uh, package deal connotations. And when you look at how many people, including you know, some best-selling authors, define ego, they build into the definition negative aspects. They say, you know, the ego is that which distorts reality. The ego is that which flatters yourself. I mean, talk about stacking the deck against a neutral approach. I mean, if you define anything in negative terms, of course it's going to be a bad thing. Of course, it's going to be the enemy. Um, and, and I think we do that because we have this bias against the self and against the individual and that one person who stands apart and says, this is what I want for me. And it just kind of mutates from there. But, uh, you, you know, like Pippa Grange, she says that ego, when you cut down to it, is our identity. Well, our identity, whether we call it the ego, the self, the soul, the spirit, whatever else, can go in any number of directions. And in that sense, ego is this neutral concept, and we make it positive or negative the way we make any aspect of ourself positive or negative. If I can add something on that about the, the bad press, I think it's probably not exaggerated, but that's, that's, that, that's more fact that through our job in jobs in elite uh, performance, we tend to mostly see the negative side of the things because often it's counterproductive. Because having the kind of attitude that I had some at some time just goes against teamwork and, and and improvement. So we also suffer a lot. We also all suffer a lot about those with those uh, negative attitudes because you just feel that. Yeah, you're not you're not uh, rolling in a, on the same on, on the same boat or same direction, and instead of developing yourself, you just keep on uh, keep on digging further. So this is why, and this is why I started to read and reread and reread. Uh, Ego is the enemy from uh, from my early day because I needed to to fix myself, but also to accept and take distance from the other egos surrounding me because they were not going in the, di the direction I thought we should go. Um, so I think this is why he has maybe such a bad press again in this world, because this is probably in the, the kind of world. Or, but we talk about elite performance sports, about, about sport, but every person I talk to even now, and, uh, and George will, can, can, um, can, can explain further about that, but even if, you, if we go into other businesses, uh, uh, could be, you know, finance uh, or whatever, this is the same story, you know. At some stage, the egos become counterproductive. And because this is what we see, then we stand to see, okay, this is, this is the enemy. But again, and that's our second chapter, there is so much 
positives of of having a strong ego in terms of achievement instead of in, in terms of being able to survive being able to to compete it's it's needed as well you know so i would say that george and he will he will comment on that also he kind of helped me to reconciliate myself after the phase of killing killing diego is the enemy he kind of helped me to reconcile myself with it and still recognize the good things you can do with it as long as you manage it better, you know. So that's why also our collaboration has been so so incredible, at least for me, is that he had a, a vision that I was a bit that was a bit different than mine on that, and he helped me to balance it also. So that was that was that was excellent to have uh, his his views on on that as well. So what differences did you bring? On the thoughts around that, job. I mean, I think it's Martin's. the, the pro-ego orientation, you know, the, the advocacy for the ego. When I first, when he and I first started talking and when I first started reading the drafts of the book, I was really taken aback by how negative so many of the portrayals of ego were, you know, both at the definitional level and how people talk about it, the examples they give. You know, we had way many more submissions for the ego F up uh, chapter than for the ego as a positive drive chapter. Um, and, and just seeing how people talked about it, I really saw that negative kind of package deal that goes into how we speak about it. So I've always had a pro ego, pro individualistic orientation. Um, we were speaking recently to Alistair McCaw, and he asked a really great question that I've been thinking about, you know, over the last year myself. And that is that the majority, or like I would say the vast majority of our 110 contributors are all from outside of the United States. We have, I would say, fewer than 10 Americans. And I would, I'm really curious how much that cultural bias really kind of kicks in there. If we were to redo this book with 110 Americans, would it be, would that balance between positive and negative views of the ego be a little bit different? Um, I've thought about this many times. Alistair brought it up, which tells me I'm not crazy. Um, so it'd be interesting to see that from the cultural perspective as well as other other lines of work. I'm not taking I'm not taking the piss here, George. I've written down cultural cultural thing question mark. So what did you have a little look actually individually on the the contributors, US centric people, Europeans, and or Aussies, and see the differences, the individual differences. We have so few American contributors. Martin would know the exact number because he; these are his colleagues. Um, but I mean, it's it's probably statistically insignificant to really draw a sample from. It. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, but you can tell, and Rob, you you know how much I I, I love the the Aussies overall. You know, I think in every mm. single podcast, I name my my Aussie colleagues, and they really don't have this. Mo- like all of most, I can say yeah, all of all of the guys I know, they really have the ego at the right place, and this is why I also always admire their approach to sports science and everything because it's always a good blend between uh, the, the the right amount of humility but still kicking asses, you know. So that's really how I define this Australian culture. Uh, thankfully, we, we see a lot of people like that in, in other, in other countries and or continents. Um, but yeah, I think there's a pretty, pretty common standard, uh, in Oz around having this, this approach. And that's why I, I really, I really like them. Mm, likewise. There, there's plenty of your stories in there in the book, Martin, around dealing with, dealing with Zlatan, which had me, had me laughing, definitely. Um, some great stories that we've talked about privately as well. But in terms of it, your ego and how you dealt with someone like that, how much ego do you need to show to be able to deal with Zlatan? Or is it completely the opposite? You would dial down because his ego is so big or comes across so big. Yeah, no, I it think is or not, is another thing. this is probably the, the best example of the, the need to, to dial and to, to manage it. Because if you don't have a minimum of ego, if you're not able to turn the volume up, he destroys you. You know, like you are, you are 10 meters under, under the ground. So you have to stand up. But if you stand up too much, then you're out as well. Because you can't, you can't be able to, to go face to face to someone like that. So it's really about finding the, the, the right, the right level. And, uh, I'm pretty sure you're, because yeah, there's a few, few good quotes and, Actually, that was not an easy exercise for me 
because I really wanted to share some of those stories because they really make the point of the whole book, you know. I'm not trying to utilize, utilize uh, my personal relationship to with him to make mm-hmm. ourselves uh, a, a, a profile, you know. So we, we, we still need to respect, uh, to respect him and our intimacy in the locker, you know. So that was a, a bit, bit of a strange exercise, but I kind of allowed me or us to, to use a few good ones because they really make the point. And one of the, the, the best ones, and I've been mentioning this story many times is that when I offered him a specific uh, drink based on BCAA or whatever for, for a specific recovery, I was coming with my f- full speed ego that was backed up by 25 uh, meta analysis mm-hmm. and that was exactly the stuff he could drink and because it was him I had added a bit I don't know based on body mass so you increase the, the the volume and then you add a bit of something else so it was the state of the art of the the recovery drink you know and he just says don't me don't give me what you think I need just give me what I want <laughs> and when you hear that you know, all those, in, like in your head, all those papers, all those, those, those years of, uh, of, of, of training, they just, they just fall apart. And you're like, uh, you're speechless, you know? <laughs> so there's two ways to answer that, to say, hey, come on, you, you, you don't know who am I? You know, you don't, you, you, you don't know where do I come from? And you have, you've seen my, my publication list, which obviously is not the best way to be received by someone like him. So you, you're, you're like, you take a deep breath, of course, and you say, all right, so let me think. Um, and then you start to think that he was not drinking my super BCAA shake for the last, the, the previous 20 years, and he still had scored, three, scored 300 goals and did some free kicks and jujitsu style uh, of, <laughs> of goals. So you must start to think, okay, this is now we have to start to balance experience, he, his experience, and let's say my knowledge. You know, and you have to go to find where's the, the best uh, compromise between both. You have, again, you have to meet him halfway and again, backed on your own ego levels. So you have to go down, paddle back a little bit to make sure you don't lose him and then get back, get back to him the next day, get back to him the next week with evidence. And then you have to, that way back to the typical soft skills and understanding how people react and so on. And, uh, just to close the story. He ended up drinking the BCIA at the end. So my ego was backed up, but just it took me some time, you know. How did you get to how did you get to the point where he ended up drinking it? Because there's a bit of a gap there between yeah, or, the quote it, and then actually. It took drinking. probably me a month, to be honest. Okay. Of of s- subtle discussion, subtle jokes. <sighs> like you know, you you work you're on a mission, but then you di- and you you kind of just you know, sometimes it's just uh, small words, advices. You give him some data. Again, depending on the player, some of them, they would love to see facts, you know. They even can read a, a sh- an abstract of an article, an infographic. Thanks, uh, Jan, of course, you know. Some of mm-hmm. them, they just want to hear their friends to talk about something. So you just have to put everything you have in your pocket, all the options, and you build it up again. So if you don't have this ego of thinking, no, no, he's going to drink that, that because I know it's good for him. If you don't have that, you just let it go. And then you don't achieve anything. So you need it, but you have to, to shape it, to manage it. Uh-huh. Just one more thing on, on Zlatan. It was it was another story in, in the book about how he drove how he drove the culture, how he drove the standards, which I thought was incredible. Do you, was it his ego driving him his own standards, which therefore drove the, the standards of the club, of the staff, of the other players? Or do you, think, do you think it's something more inbuilt within his character which enabled him to do that? Maybe it's a, it's a bit of both. It's everything. Okay. You just have the level of confidence that nothing can happen. Like, uh, I don't know, some people, they have uh, something in their pocket that gives them strength, you know? Hmm. You, have, uh, you have him in the locker, you'll be fine. It's just something you can't really measure. But like the confidence he has in itself radiates to everything, everyone around. And that's why even like, and George kind of pushed me to even use him a bit even more in the book to build the stories around him. But from day one, from the day I met him, he changed my life as a practitioner also, for sure. He is the the player that, that had the biggest impact on me. Because his attitude was so, 
in the end, it's positive. In the end, it's, it's driving the standard at such a level that I can say that I was probably driving the standard at the same level when I have my PhD student and I was just kicking their asses every time they were not sending something perfect, you know? It's more or less the same, the same type of approach of getting things done, but at the highest level you can. And that's why I respect him so much for that, you know? There's nothing to say. George, so given what Martin just said, how important is it to have those individuals with that heightened ego to be able to drive the culture, drive the sta- drive the standards in an environment, even if it's not a high performance environment? I, mean, I, I think it's I think it can be very important. Um, I don't think it's necessary. I mean, I think those standards and that leadership can come from anywhere. But um, but but you have to have obviously you have to have the right uh, approach to ego and to setting the standards and the culture. And one thing I really like about uh, the Zlatan story, and, you know, the two stories that we just had there, it goes back to a, a phrase we hear a lot in sports when we talk about ego, but that we don't really hear anywhere else in life. And how often do we say about a player like Zlatan, you know, he's got a huge ego, but at least he's got the chops to back it up. Like Martin said, you know, he's got this huge ego, but you know what? He scored 300 goals and he's in his late 30s now, still kicking ass in Syria. You can't deny the man his ego the size of Sweden. You know, he's earned it. Martin has earned his ego. I mean, he, he's got that stack of papers a mile long and, you know, everything he's accomplished in his field. So when you have somebody where you can see that they back up their ego, that whatever they bring to the, you know, ego space, the ego environment, that they can back it up. That's the person you're going to follow. Because it's not the size of the ego, it's how connected it is to reality, because the ego is just reflecting what they've done. And in the case of someone like Zlatan, what they have the ambition to do more. I mean, how could you question Zlatan in your locker room? You know what he's done. You see what he does every day. Of course, it's going to keep going. And I think that's why this book is so useful to people outside of the sports world, because in sports, it's so easy for us to quantify the ego. Can Zlatan back it up? Yes, here is his profile on transfer market any questions um but you know it's a lot harder if you're (laughs) you know developing your your startup if you're you know working in whatever field you know when you think about what other fields have you know are known for having large ego individuals they're the ones where you can very much quantify someone's success finance law medicine you know the patient recovered or the patient died you won your case or you didn't. You IPO'd huge or your IPO crashed. They can back up their egos to objective results. And in a way, they're lucky that they can do that because many fields of endeavor don't have that. And I think sports just gives a great lens to understanding how the ego has to connect to reality. And when we assess whether someone has a large ego or a little ego, um, a loud ego or a small ego, we have that objective reference. And then we can decide for ourselves whether we respect them or not, whether we're going to follow them or not. Yeah, exactly. You can, you will, I mean, if I talk about myself, I will always accept someone, let's say with the ego, the ego out at a high volume, if he delivers. The problem is when there's this disconnect, not delivering, but still thinking you do. And this is, this is the, 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 the biggest problem that we often encounter. And, I mean, you know, last summer, I, like I said, I wielded my ego to get on board this project. And then around August or September, I was like, oh my God, you know, I I was the duck. I was calm and cool on the surface and paddling like hell underneath. Because what did I sign up for? I'm a blog writer. And, you know, I'm working with Martin. I'm writing this book. Oh, (laughs) Jesus. But, you know, um, as Martin will tell you, you know, I... We, we had our share of conflicts. We had some difficult conversations to hash this out. Um, both my thoughts, and my abilities. I went dark. I read and studied like a son of a bitch for a few months to get to where I probably should have been at the outset. Um, and I had those moments where I was like, wow, did I screw Martin by, you know, <laughs> getting that far out over my skis? I don't think so. Uh, we could take that conversation offline, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> How many of the 200 publications do you read, George? Oh, um, at least 195. I mean, I, I, have, <laughs> yeah, I have alerts on my phone <laughs> every time a new one drops. <laughs> <laughs> 
How, just what you just said then about the able to quantify ego, how difficult is that now with the influence of social media and people getting on board knowing that that can be skewed based on certain behaviours on social media? And I'll come back to you, Martin. How how does that sit with you and the use of social media to boost, use ego to boost influence and try to skew the objectivity of what people see is worthwhile to look at and take on board? Yeah, I think, you know, you, you could do a masterclass on, on, on social media. <laughs> I think the first thing to remember Every time any of us, we, you look at the post, is that the post, it, like someone put it himself on his, uh, on his, pro- his own uh, opinion or his own uh, practice. So, um, so it's, you always do your own self-promotion. You do your own self-tweet. You do your own. So that, that's, that's the truth. And then I would say the rule is to remind ourselves or to ask ourselves every time we tweet something or post something is is this really necessary in a sense like what i'm bringing to the world so um and i've I've been tweeting a, a lot about that already like am i tweeting just a screenshot of the acceptance of my paper which is completely hopeless to the world or you say, hey, by the way, I have this new, this new paper. Here's the full link because I want to share because I want to bring something to the community. That's on the extreme both sides of the spectrum. Sharing and, uh, and of course, we talked about Jan already. Um, there's a lot of people doing this very, very well. Uh, we discuss that often with uh, my friend JB, JB Morin, about the need today to put things on social media as a way to, to spread out what we do, to, to make it accessible. So... This is the, the, the best part of, of, of social media. But if you want, if you are just tweeting when you are sharing a link of a blog, a nice blog post you've written or a paper, you cannot tweet every day, you know? So it has to be qualitative tweets or retweeting things. So that's, that's the beauty and the, the, the really good things of social media. But again, the screenshot of the paper acceptance, uh, are still, I just don't, I just cannot almost accept that. And then you have Instagram, which is a, a biggest problem for me because you don't have the ability to put, to link your stuff unless you have uh, 10 followers. So it's, it's pictures. So the norm becomes picture of myself doing my job, picture of myself with players, picture of myself. So it's, it's picture of myself. So again, is it necessary? What are you bringing to the world? That's a, that's a very good question. Um, and they're probably good, good, better formats than others if you still want to, to share. Again, the infographic, they work on Instagram. The small clips you post, uh, Rob, they work very well on Instagram. Um, is it necessary? Of course, because it helps people to understand and to get access to, because they see bits of the podcast and they want to, so this is, this is great. Picture of yourself. Phew. What does it bring, you know? Um, but yeah, that, that could be a full, a, f- a full podcast because I just had, we just had one quick question, I think a bit on, uh, around social media on the, the, the interview. And there were some really spicy responses, but I'm sure we could, we could run a full, a, f- a full, f- a full survey again, just on that. And I know already who from the 20 to 25, uh, responders, contributors who will be very, very relevant into, into this topic. Got to be a spicy one, definitely. What what was what was spicy? Can you give us any examples? It's that's that's how that's more or less what I said, but I said it nicely, oh. you know. But just about okay. making making oneself a profile when you don't have anything, because again, you post yourself what you want to do, so you can make yourself as good looking as good as you want, because you choose you choose everything. So it's, there's a bias. It's not even a bias. It's, uh, it's, I don't know. It's the level. It's, it's just, uh, yeah. What, one of the, one of the more fun mm-hmm. things of the sure. last year, one of us had the idea to come up with a fake Twitter account. And we, we honestly got started going live with it, but instead we found a little website that'll generate, you know, pictures of fake tweets and fake, li- fake LinkedIn profiles. And we started writing posts that kind of satirized some people in our field. 
And it got to the point, you know, like a lot of, uh, it's, I think it's Poe's law that sooner or later satire and reality converge. And some of the fake tweets and fake Instagram posts Martin and I came up with, you couldn't tell if they were real or if they were made up by us because because you know those people. You've seen those tweets. Well, <laughs> wait a minute, George. So the, the, the ones that you quote in the book are not real? No. The, uh, so we we made up some. But all the quotes from the okay. contributors are real. Um, you know, our satire is very, uh, very obvious, the, the fake tweet accounts. But, you know, it, it's not hard to find inspiration for those people who, you know, carefully overcultivate their presentation and, you know, who, who drift down towards narcissism and vanity. You know, they just overshoot the ego entirely and they just land in the narcissism, you know, look at me realm. And I mean... There's plenty of people down oh, there. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it's it's staff. It's standing room only. Um, but, like, w- one of the things, you know, that I think about, like, you know, those are people who want to be seen. You know, ego cool. as a tool of connecting with reality. Ego is about you seeing. Ego is you looking out. Narcissism, vanity, as we see it play out in social media, is about being seen. It's about what you're trying to get coming into you. Um, the clicks, the likes, the follows, you know, all of those kind of metrics. So... I'm I'm much more negative on social media than Martin is. Uh, he sees much more of the good in that world than I do. I'll admit that right up front. <laughs> but, but but placing yourself down there, and this is just my observation. There's a few people that come to mind that I, I won't mention, but I'm sure we can all think of some that develop almost like disciples down that end of the spectrum, and it becomes very weird very quickly with those type of people because they seem to pull in the people like them and it 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 seems to grow exponentially when then people keep doing the things that they do which then drives why they're there in the first place which is the narcissism and it keeps growing and this balloon just so this this just gets bigger it's it's a very strange place it's a very strange place you know on on that and uh, i guess that's nothing really new there's a lot of social uh, analysis and uh, psychology around the use of social media so i don't want to mm. be to say something that i'm not really legitimate or an expert on it but i've, I've witnessed that you know i've witnessed like people having a, a bad moment or feeling a bit like i mean people could be players you know without willing to say too much uh and then they straight on the social media just to get a few a few thousand likes and then everything Boost. you just got the, the the loves come comes back and you have a you, you sleep better you know um but then what what ryan holiday says and i think it's a very nice way to put it to get to to kind of lose this uh because you you yeah as you said almost you, you become dependent addict you know as well Addict to those likes, you know, just imagine, uh, Instagram is, is, is down for 24 hours. Where are you going to get your, your, your adrenaline from? How are you going to get the love from, you know? So that just shows, if you, if you think about that, just what, what happens if for, for two days I don't, I don't open the app? Of course, you have to be able to, to survive uh, without, without those, those likes, you know? Um, and, when you see the, the the rhythm and some of the publication of of our colleagues, I definitely wonder how they would they would do if it, that was to happen. And and you know, like mm-hmm. going back to where where you started that point, Rob, you know, I think it's a it's a little bit different when we're talking about like you know our professional colleagues or you know people in their professional capacity, separate from the players, because you know the players are the ones you know like Mara said you know that post that post defeat love, as opposed to like you said that that weird follower discipleship that we see among you know certain people on the professional side of things and you know i think we kind of come back to a lot in the book is you know with ego but also just a rule of life reality always wins you can build up whatever veneer of competence you want to on social media you can have all of those disciples following you but get out on the training ground get in the gym show me what you've actually done you know you can curate and cultivate your image all day but if you don't if you don't have the chops to back it up, you're going to screw over an athlete's career. You're going to screw over your own career. You're going to get called out because reality will always win. And you know, unfortunately, that justice isn't always as uh, swift and public as we might like, as we're uh, you know working in the trenches every day. But I think there is a little bit of comfort in knowing that 
you are doing your job right. You know, we have control over what we do in our jobs. And if that guy wants to build a hundred thousand followers on Twitter, great. I've got 12 athletes in front of me that I'm improving today. You know, who's, who's really sleeping better tonight. Mm. One thing that I wanted to pick up on Martin, and this was the Bushite, the Bushite test, mm. which obviously isn't a thing, but it could have been. <laughs> What was your th- what was your thought process with that? And just looking back, would you? I'm guessing I know the answer, but would you have done anything different? So obviously talking about the the 3015, exactly about the name. Mm. Yes. So yeah, year 2000. So <laughs> I'm I'm Mister Nobody. You know, I'm really Mister Nobody. I have done I don't know. Yeah, I'm Mister Nobody anyway. So. But I'm, I'm thinking, I believe that I have a, a good idea around this, this test. And there's a few mentors around me just telling me that I should keep, keep working on that because it's something. But I never even thought about putting my name on it. Uh, so it was just, I don't know. I think at the start, I had it like uh, in French, uh, like it was a shuttle intermittent test, like in French, but the initials were a bit dodgy so we didn't really know how to name it but that was not to be my name on it even though you already had the Conconi test from Conconi you had the Luc Leger from Luc Leger you always have all those guys all those names and then good good a colleague uh, student or friend of mine uh, Alexandre Delal French guy French fitness coach who has also participated in the book he started to Use the test, which was great because he was helping me to, to disseminate it in, 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 uh, with his teams. But he started to call it the, the, the Bushai test. And I said, no, 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 <laughs> no, no, there's something wrong with that. Uh, I don't want to be, that, no, that's not me. So then I said, okay, it's 3015, it's intermittent various fitness, blah, blah, blah. So let's make it 3015 intermittent fitness test. So that I kind of laid this name to make sure it would not carry mine. No regrets? Of course not. <laughs> of course not. And no one would be able to either write the name properly or pronounce the name of the test anyway. So better like that. 3015 works in every language. Yes, yes. I'll get your take on this in a minute, George, with people who you've had around you in, 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 your, uh, in your career. But in terms of staff and having staff around you, Matt, in your experience and dealing with you as a performance director head of in a position like that and pushing your staff to be to get on a stage or go on a podcast or write an article but also pushing that the humility side as well and the reason I asked that is probably four or five years ago I had David Joyce who was very um, forward thinking in trying to get his staff onto the podcast, which was great because Lachlan Wilmot came on, Jess Spendl of the Nutritionist came on, and we had various different people who were great in and around David Joyce. And I thought that was quite forward-thinking at the time. Uh, Darren Burgess had done it. You've done it with with Mattia. Um, and I'm just thinking the way you think about that type of stuff, and especially around social media, is that quite a hard balance for you to push these kind of people into those areas and into those arenas but also keep that humility or try to push that humility in their character as well yeah exactly it's about building confidence because if you come on on your show you must have a minimum a minimum of of confidence because you know you're gonna have things to say and you're gonna not shit in your pants because of (laughs) eventually thinking about the the audience you know like i do every week and That's just why I'm, I'm talking to you for the fifth uh, time, as you know, you know, so, uh, that's, that's an easy one, uh, of course. But you have to make sure when you're talking, you don't sound like a, like a dick, you know. <laughs> so you have to find the, the right, the right balance. But that's easier said than done because again, and actually it's very nice that you mentioned this, uh, this episode with, um, with David, uh, Joyce. Because that's probably when I really started to think that I should not miss any of the episode of, of your show. And then when I started to go backwards to make sure I would, I would listen to the, the first that I missed. And I really, really, really enjoyed this, this episode from, from David Joyce. That was, that was kind of, yeah, something 
I really, really liked it. And again, I was thinking, oh, those Aussies, they are very good because there was not even a question. I don't think even David had to ask anyone at the club. He said, okay, let's do it. You know, yeah. there's so many other environments. Our football, don't mention even NBA or some of the, the, the American uh, clubs. You just can't do it because you have such a, a res- the need to be, to be reserved. You just can't talk. And that also creates kind of almost a second, a parallel world. So you have the guys have the freedom to talk. And then you hear Martin for the fifth time because now he can do what he wants. But then you have so many good practitioners who, that we would like to hear from them, but they just cannot, you know? So, yeah, and it's not because they yeah, don't talk that they're, they're not good. Maybe often those who talk more are not that, not the best because they might still be in the club and, you know, see what I mean? So I think there's, um, there could be easily a, a distortion again on the real value of people thanks to this exposure to, to podcast. So this is why every time all of us, you will listen to a podcast or look on, look up on social media, you have to have the, the BS detector on definitely. 100%. The Aaron Cooks bullshit filter. George, how does that sit in the environments that you've worked in in terms of managing that? The pushing of ego, but the the maintaining of the humility. I mean, I I, I agree with everything Myron said. I think it's applicable to, to any level and and any situation that you're in. And I think you know, I, I think what Myron really kind of keyed in on there is that you know it's not always just about him, you know, and and that's not incompatible with his ego or anyone's ego. Is that you know he's he wants to get other people out there. He wants to get other voices, his colleagues or just other people he's come across. He wants to get them out onto a show because, you know, we can all learn from their different perspectives and your listeners can only hear Martin so many times. They might want to hear someone else's perspective. Uh, and that's great, you know? And, and, and the more you can kind of foster that, the more you can kind of do what you can in that mentorship role to help someone, you know, new or someone younger uh, develop into a healthy ego and develop into a positive impact on their field. Well, that's a really positive impact that we could each have. And I think that's, you know, part of going back to Martin's reason for having the book is, you know, he had great mentors 15, 20 years ago that he helped him get here. Um, and I, I think, you know, if we can help people start that journey earlier, both in the terms of recognizing who they should be hitching their car to and who they can learn from and who will have the most positive influence on their life early on when you're both full of ego and, you know, but, but not, but empty of knowledge, but also kind of awestruck by the people around you, you know, you know, being able to identify who's really the person of substance that you can kind of go along with, um, is a, is a huge help to your career. I mean, when, when I think of the impact my mentor has had on me over the last 10, 11 years, I mean, I probably wouldn't be here right now if he didn't keep me in the sports industry during some dark times back in 17 and 18. Um, you know, to have someone like that in your life and then to reach the point, you know, where you can, you know, be that person for a, you know, for someone younger, whether it's a young athlete or, you know, an intern, you know, that's a, that's the real impact that you can have, you know, more than, more than putting your name on a test, more than getting your social media. I agree. I mean, I think that's one of the biggest things um, a good mentor can do is actually enhancing and helping you build that bullshit filter because you go on Twitter, you go on Instagram. For for young coaches, for 21-year-old, straight out of university, doing undergraduate, doing a master's, go on Twitter and go on Instagram. And maybe they're not quite aware of it because this is just their world, but figuring out who is actually someone to learn from who is someone to read a little bit more into read their work it must be just a minefield of where the hell do i go who do i trust who do i trust where to put my time and just resist the the temptation to get so overwhelmed and incredibly yeah just incredibly overwhelmed with the information that's out there for someone now coming through it must be super super tough in any industry and, 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 you know, I came into sports, you know, in my early 30s. And so I already had some good professional experience. I was in a pretty, you know, difficult, challenging and, you know, high pressure environment in the Navy. And I still made those mistakes. Yeah. And that was before social media was as crazy as it is now. And I wasn't a 21 year old fresh off undergrad. So, yeah, I mean, I can only imagine how hard it is because if someone with some life experience in his mid 30s 
can, you know, follow a few carts and then be, and then after a year or two be like, shit, these two are idiots. <laughs> well, again, fortunately I had the person, you know, that was the idiot to help me out there. But yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a minefield. It's an absolute disaster. Um, don't, don't just buy every book you hear on a podcast. Oh, crap. Wasn't going to say that. <laughs> do, do, do. Yes, please buy um, books you hear on podcasts. <laughs> George, I'd like I'd like to just ask you about another thing that's always interesting to me and comes up in social on social media all the time, and I know Martin's very very passionate about is job titles, <laughs> job titles, and this is something. I mean, you may have a different uh, opinion on this, but this is where the ego just comes alive. The Twitter bio, the LinkedIn profile, it's an absolute, it's it's, it's gold. To watch it, watch these things unfold, whether it performance architect, whether it be, I mean, Martin's probably got a list as long as his arm of, of examples of, uh, of job titles that are out there. But put my mind at rest. It's not just sports science. It's not just strength and condition that has this problem. It's every single industry out there who you've got guys making up job titles to differentiate themselves. Am I right? Yeah, I mean, and I mean, you know, in, in some places, it's you know, your promotions are based on it. Obviously, your LinkedIn profile, and some places, you know, will give you a title bump. Like, oh, hey, we don't, we don't have the money to give you a promotion or to give you a raise this year, but we'll give you a title bump. I mean, really? Mm-hmm. So yeah, I mean, that's, I don't know that 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 must be that, you know, that that eternal search for status, but it's definitely not unique. I don't think it's, you know, it's 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 sadly universal. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm sure I'm sure you know we could you know go to any field, any endeavor, and get a list as long as Myron's arm from their world as well. You know, senior senior financial performance consultant for strategic affairs, <laughs> Your, Eurasia division. I mean, come on. <laughs> how big? How big is the this? I mean, genuinely, Martin. How big is this problem in our industry for for the confusion that lies within who does what with who and why and all that kind of stuff yeah so of, of course you, you you refer also among others the the the, the survey and the paper we we did with uh, dave carolan carolan a mm-hmm. uh, couple of years ago now um and uh yeah it, it was just uh it was just incredible the, the confusion, as you said, about th- those titles, and I think that probably explains as well why the survey you did about the salaries, you know, was also pretty difficult to to yeah. get an outcome because when you're asking salaries for job titles, because the job, job title doesn't reflect their role, what do we Everyone's do? Everyone's ahead of. Yes, of Everyone's course. Everyone's ahead of, so, you, well, so it doesn't differentiate between anything. Because fair enough, as long as you. Are at least you can be the head of yourself. That that works. And even if you have one assistant who's part who's part time, you're also the head of this part time assistant. And if you only have, let's say, in the club, a conditioning coach and a physio, and you are responsible of the physio, you can also be the high performance manager because you are the highest uh, possible in in the in the organigram. So. No, the, the problem is when you talk with, uh, let's say, a sporting director. Uh, or president of a club asking you to uh, your your vision about building a, building a department building a club or, or so on then you have to explain them how does it work and I've been using my the, the stuff that we published from from this survey I have a few a few examples of structures with different levels depending on the responsibilities we have and that was a, a bit of a, I think that was pretty helpful to and uh, people came back to me as well saying ah cool we could use your figure three because our club, we want to move from figure three to figure four. Or, you know, like trying to give a, a framework around that. Uh, so I'm not definitely not trying to push people to use the framework we used. But at least that's something that came up almost organically that kind of emerged from those 200 something uh, responses. So if we had this ability to have this framework somewhere and then people would say, OK, I have a level three. Fair enough. I mean, you may be not exactly the same title, but you know where you sit in in the on on the on the ladder, you know. Uh, but again, it's back to back to status. You cannot imagine how funny it is because I follow that because I, I just like like it just makes me laugh. I, lo- I like it when I when people change job, how quickly the Twitter status status changes. It, be- it comes yeah. before anything. 
you know, like say, got the job, bang, status, <laughs> you know. Um, I did it as well, you know, when I, when I joined Kitman, uh, but it was kind of company oriented, coordinated because we wanted, I was proud of joining the company. They wanted also to, 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 to tell uh, people that I was joining them. So we had, a, we, we did it nicely, you know, with the marketing involved. So that was, well, that was the same. But it was maybe not just for just just for for me. It was for us, let's say. So I was happy to do it. You know. And I, and I think not to put you in a difficult position, Martin. But I think that kind of thing is happening more and more. Where an organisation, whether it's a new hire, where they've never had a director of performance before, and now they've got one, may actually want that individual to be on LinkedIn. Maybe may want them to be on Twitter, showcasing that. But that individual may not be as comfortable in doing that but i suppose they have to tow the tow their new party line yeah exactly yeah yeah i've there's there's, in, there's examples in in corporate world of of um staff having to do linkedin linkedin articles and things like that about products and whatnot i suppose it gets into a very murky world of who is doing what for who and why and the kind of internal messages that have been fed through these channels. So it's um, the bullshit filter is definitely, definitely worth honing, uh, especially in these, these, these worlds, but brand building is another one, another justification for the incessant tweeting about oneself, um, especially, especially now. And it was, a, it was an episode that came up with Robin Thorpe. Um, George used to be at Manchester United is now a, a consultant but this the role of the consultant now in sports science and people going off to do their individual thing and and get contracts with with clubs and and the brand building i suppose is justification for people going into that world so it's potential that this could this kind of thing could be and the utilization of social media for contracts is potentially something that's going to increase and increase and maybe that the switch towards the narcissism side of the scale may be, uh, may be increased. But I suppose, that, again, George, that's something that is happening in every industry. Journalism, sports media, yeah, whatever think, it may I, be. Yeah, it's it's everywhere. And I think, like you said, you know, more people are are going into that. You know, it's so much easier now because of, you know, online marketplaces for work or talent for there to be consultants and then you know that that brings savings to the companies too i mean it's it's a lot cheaper for a company to hire a consultant or a contractor on a project basis than to support you know the, that level of employees for however long so i think you're right we are going to see more people in those kind of transient you know project-based roles which is going to then you know raise the value of their brand building abilities which uh you know that's how it's going to be to a large extent and we'll just have to see how it shakes out yeah. But, you know, again, let's say branding yourself, you see a lot of people have done it like, like myself for when I re- rebuilt my website, I asked a mm-hmm. company to just to give me, a, to make me a logo, a few things so that you are kind of recognizable. Well, I think it's, it's nice. Again, it's same as the Twitter thing. As long as you build your brand to bring something to the community, it's fine. And at least you see an infographic from maybe Martin, you know, it's not the same infographic than Jans or what Brett, Brett Bartholomew is doing. It's, it's, he has its symbol as well. It's, that's perfect because you know where did that come from? That those guys are sharing something. They're sharing content. And on that, because that's a segue to talk about Jans infographic, what I just can't really understand is that how many other people are using the white, the white men's in their infographics. Yes. This is Jans IP from day one. So everyone is free to do an infographic, but just do, use uh, black men then, you know, but keep leave the white men for Jan. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, no, I agree. I agree. And there's, there's probably so many examples of that, that someone for so long, like there was no infographics apart from Jan's for ages. Yeah. And then there seemed to be a big influx, all using the little white men and the little white men are now in presentations and animated and all that kind of thing yeah no i completely agree but back to the back to the book when can people get it where can people get it is there accompanying material websites and that kind of thing who's going to take that one 
George, George. Yeah, he's been working on it today. So he has some oh, fresh news. Nice. So our fresh. website, which will possibly be live by the time this show airs, is eaglesbook.com. So e the name of the book is eagles, E-G-O-A-L-S, book.com. Um, and it will be available on Amazon sometime in the next Sometime before too long. I'll go with that. And Marin and I can continue swinging about this later. <laughs> um, but yes, Eagle's book will have, you know, information. It'll be the link to the Amazon page. It will also have, you know, some quotes, you know, and information, you know, ch overview of the different chapters, some quotes from our contributors. So people who listen to Pacey uh, Performance Podcast will no doubt recognize probably most of the names on that list. And, you know, they, they can go from there. Nice. So when I'm going to nail down to a date, when can, do you think people will be able to get it? Uh -oh. <laughs> no, now it depends on uh, our ability to put that through the, the Amazon system because we chose to, yeah. to self-publish based on the really poor experience I had with the, the former editing company. I published some stuff before. Okay. <laughs> so we want to, to have control of it, to have control of okay. content. And, uh, we're looking forward to that, but we have not clicked on the last, uh, the last pages, but we are not very far from it, we're definitely. So it's a matter of, okay. depends on when you air the we're, podcast. We're, anyway. I mean, we're still Go. just fine tuning yep. a few things in the book, making sure it's as close to perfect as possible, but it should be very soon. And for anyone that wants some nice little tweetable quotes, to go on Twitter and whatnot, absolute gold. There's some superb quotes in there. Yeah, great stuff. So, Martin, I know you don't like particularly like doing this kind of thing, but we didn't do the intro at the start, so I'm going to ask you to do this at the end. Where can people find out more about you and what you've got going on? The website, which is martin-bushite.net, yeah, uh, has all the stuff we publish with all my contributors, uh, whatever they are, wh whatever they do. And then socials, Mart one Bush on both Twitter and Insta to make the, the, the full, uh, the full package. The full compliment. Yeah. George, what about you for other things that are not ego related or maybe are ego related? Who knows? Oh, it's all ego related. <laughs> uh, my website, I'm currently building it right now. Despite my love of ego, God, the idea of having to write about myself on a website is somewhere around the seventh circle of hell. So I've been slow rolling that to work on the book. So sooner or later, I will have a website which will link off of our website and other places. Um, for now, you know, and when our website goes up, you will be able to contact people. Will be able to contact both Martin and I through the website. Um, it will be George at Eaglesbook.com. But uh, yeah, and I don't like I said, I only see the negatives of social media, so you're not going to really find me there either. So. <laughs> I I know that I know that's I know that's horrible for my brand. I know it's completely counterintuitive as a marketing professional, but you know, is what it is. <laughs> and there are also 200 George Perry on, on Google, if you Google it. <laughs> yes, it's, it's, it's a wonderful <laughs> level of anonymity. But if you, do put the word, if you do put the word sports after my name, I'm pretty sure I'm the only one who does this. Nice. Nice. People can find you there. Perfect. George, Martin, thank you very much for your time. It's been a pleasure speaking to you and looking forward to seeing the book on Amazon, whenever that may be. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> no, thanks Cheers, for the, guys. Thanks for the chat. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.